an essential biblical doctrine and therefore an essential doctrine of this church is the doctrine of salvation. Salvation or soteriology is a broad doctrine and deals with the work of Christ, the Redeemer, and its application to the elect by the Holy Spirit. During this lesson, we're going to use Romans 8, 29, and 30 to focus on some major aspects of the doctrine of salvation. So turn with me to Romans 8, 29 to 30. And we have two different handouts here. One is the main one for the class, and another one's a diagram of the golden chain in the text we're looking at. <clears throat> okay, so let's read Romans 8, 29, and 30. Uh, those are the focus texts, but I'm going to start at 28 because that group fits together well in context. Thank you. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. <clears throat> These are some major aspects of salvation, which we're going to briefly look at this morning. Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. I hope to address some application along the way. If you'd like, please reference and use this handout. This is what we hand out in Essentials. <clears throat> I plan to reference it. Before jumping into the terms of Romans 8, 29 through 30, let me give a brief reminder of the context of Romans 8. In Romans 8, 17, if you look there, and if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Paul reminds his readers that they must suffer with Christ in this life in order that they may be glorified with Christ. Then in verse 18, he boldly claims that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory to be revealed to us. From here, he gives three proofs as evidence why his claim is true. Creation, believers, and the Spirit are longing for glorification with groanings in different ways. Then he concludes by explaining what the plan of God, according to which the Spirit intercedes in verses 28 to 30. The Spirit intercedes on our behalf according to the glorious sovereign plan of God, which stretches from eternity through time into eternity. This plan, as revealed in Romans 8, 29 to 30, is called the golden chain of salvation by a lot of theologians. Um, there's another handout. Looks like this. Has a chain up here. <clears throat> That's to help you picture the chain when we speak of it. So let's reread Romans 8, 28 through 30 and keep moving. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. I'm going to reference this handout now and read this paragraph at the base of it. 
it helps show the connectivity of this chain and why it's even called a chain. Notice the chain of events. Those whom God knew or fixed his heart upon in ages past, he marked out or ordained. And in time, he called effectually and he justified and he glorified. So indissoluble is the chain that the last link is here viewed as an accomplished fact because the first links are so. The exact number known by God before the world began shall be glorified. No more, no less. And all of them must and will pass through each of these five steps. To illustrate, suppose God foreknew 100 individuals. Then he predestined 100 individuals. He called 100, he justified 100, and he glorified 100 individuals. None are gained, none are lost. He will bring to salvation each individual whom he set his heart on, loved, before the world began. This is why it's called a chain. Because the links are inseparable. If you pick up a chain at any link, you pick up the whole chain. And it, it is so with this doctrine of salvation. If you pick up calling, comes with it foreknowledge of God. It comes with it glorification. <clears throat> so how do we know all things work together for good for those who love God who are called because of God's plan which we're calling the golden chain assurance here is based on God's plan of salvation let's look at each term in the chain so the first one is for no for new for knowledge um, in the Greek, I want to use the Greek words because they help differentiate between these terms. Even if you're not familiar, you can at least hear it in association. And I can give you the Greek definition. Progenosko, choose beforehand or know beforehand. Um, <clears throat> two authors, Steele and Thomas, give a definition. Foreknowledge is equivalent to forelove. Those who were the objects of God's love, he marked out for salvation. I want to show you that from Romans 11. 11, 11.2. That this foreknow means foreloved. Because um, some people may take this to mean God looks into the future of his creation and sees faith. And his people, and on the basis of what he sees, he predestines them to salvation. <clears throat> so because of that, that prevalent teaching, I want to prove this definition I just gave you and not just have it hang out there with something I just said. So Romans eleven two, the same word is used. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. That's the same word for new. It's talking about Israel. And I want to look at a text in Deuteronomy 7 to show and illustrate how God foreknew Israel. Deuteronomy 7. Seven through eight. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in any, more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So you can see how. It wasn't because Israel was worthy 
of being loved. They weren't a great nation or their number wasn't great. It was because God loved them that they became a nation. Uh, look with me at Jeremiah 1.5. I'm showing you some of the concept of for love. This is talking about, you know, Jeremiah, an individual now, instead of a nation. But then the word of the Lord came to me. I'm, I'm reading in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Um, he's... Seeking to um, bolster Jeremiah's faith and strengthen him. And he does it by saying, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He's not saying, I knew about you. He's saying, I knew you. Um, Another place you can see uh, a cognate of this word in the New Testament is in Matthew. Of course, over here in the Old Testament, uh, we're looking at the concept, but now I want to go to Matthew and look at this word used in the Greek. Or, um, Bogdan. Matthew 7. Verses uh, 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He's not saying, I never knew about you. Because he's the judge of all the earth. He he knew these people who he's sending into destruction. He knew of them. He knew about them. He knew that who they were. It's not I knew you were uh, about you or I knew you were going to be like this. He's saying I didn't know you in a loving relationship, in an intimate, uh, affectionate relation. I did not know you that way. So. Um, in Romans chapter 8, that's the way that I believe is the proper interpretation. Some believe, you know, this means that God is foreseeing and knowing the potential faith of believers. But if you look in the Romans text, there's no need to try to add to it any qualifiers. You don't need to add in there whom he foreknew would have faith. Uh, God isn't foreknowing events of believers like potential faith. He's knowing them. He's foreknowing them individually. Um, There is a lot of literature on this argument. And for time's sake, I'm going to move on. But if anybody is hung up on that, please come see me when there's free time today. I even brought some books with me I can show you. Uh, Does anybody have any questions on taking foreknowledge as for love? Sure. Um, Genesis 4.1 says, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, Love, it's an intimate Love between and that's the use of that. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, it an, an application I think for believers with this is to resist the thinking 
that this doctrine of salvation is cold. Um, God for loved you. Um, he set his affection on you before he created anything. And because he set his love upon you, he predestined that you would be glorified with Christ. <clears throat> so don't think of the order of salvation as a cold doctrine, but um, be encouraged and comforted uh, as you persevere with this knowledge that God foreknew you. <clears throat> Let's go to the next term. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He also predestined. Before reading the handout on this, let me address predestination versus election. Uh, we have a we have a system at, we have in our repertoire of words and definitions and our understanding of those words. We have words that come to us in systematic theologies, and we have words that come straight out of the Bible. Sometimes they match up, and sometimes the systematics are talking about. A theology, and you can't just meet, put all of that into one text in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> we need to be careful to get our definitions from context. So if we're reading about election in the systematic theology, we need to get the context of that systematic theology, understand election. If we're reading about it in the Bible, there's different forms of election in the Bible. There's election of a nation. There's election that's eternal, your salvation. Uh, so context should be a, a helpful guide to us as we look at the word meanings. And in Romans 8, in context, Paul uses a Greek word in Romans 8, 29 and 30, and it's pro And uh, a helpful definition of that is to decide upon beforehand to decide upon beforehand or predetermine I believe predestination is a good translation in context Paul is stating that those who are foreknown or foreloved by God are predetermined or predestined for his planned end which the part of God's plan, which Paul highlights, is to be conformed to the image of his son so that Christ can be preeminent among many brethren. I think this section could have been titled Predestination also on our handout. Titled it elect, uh, Election. We could have titled it Predestination if we're trying to stick pretty close to the Romans. <clears throat> the focus, the predestination of God here is the end of conformity to Christ. Uh, because of the handout is going with election, um, I want to read that definition. But when you read systematics, they'll talk to you and you'll learn in Reformed systematics or those who are picking up Reformed theology. There's predestination. And predestination deals with God predetermining the eternal destinies of uh, rational create creation, like man and angels. And then sometimes they'll leave out angels and just make it about men. But it's dealing with those who are, I call them rational. We're rational creatures we're not we yet we're able to worship god we have moral faculties we have a will and within predestination you have election and you have reprobation so systematics you'll read predestination and they're meaning it more broadly to encompass the destinies of all people and then when they use the word election we're talking about believers 
uh, in context, Paul's referencing believers. He uses the word predestined. In the Greek, it just means predetermined. But let me read this definition. This is more of a systematic definition of election. And it's right here at the heart of this word that we're looking at. Election is an act of God before creation in which he chooses some people to be saved. Not on account of any foreseen merit in them, but only because of his sovereign good pleasure. So he chooses some. It's not because of any foreseen merit. And it's only because of his good pleasure. That's election. It's very much opposed in history by a lot of different people groups. And whenever you make man an idol, you're going to oppose this. Because you want to say man doesn't need election. That's unfair. It's violating man's free will. <clears throat> um, but let's look at Second Timothy one nine, which is a reference here. This is bringing out this concept that God chooses and acts before time began. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And if you look at 1 Peter 1, 2. To the pilgrims, I'll read it, I'll start at one. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So you can see election. We could go to Ephesians. You go to Acts 13. There's many places that election is taught in Scripture. Um, how does election refute the idea of works, salvation? Yeah, amen. Amen. Uh, Mr. Tom. I think we uh, can you wait? He's got it. I think it's working now. Uh, this helps clearly define the cause and the effect. The effect, yeah. There's there's good works that he set aside for you to do. The cause, it's all him. <laughs> Amen. If you look at. Uh, Romans 9, just one page over, verses 10 and 12. That's exactly what Paul is, is uh, making very clear. That election is opposed to works, salvation. Romans 9, 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac... For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. You can see how 
It's before they exist. And it's done that way that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand and not of works. So if you have a works-based mentality of salvation, the more clearly you understand election, the more difficulty you're going to have with it. And you're going to find yourself trying to reinterpret it or fight it. But look at the text. Um, Richard A. Muller says this about election. These are a couple. I'm going to give Muller and Calvin. Election is the positive part of predestination according to which God chooses in Christ those individuals who will be his eternally. Dictionary of Latin and Greek theological term. Calvin, he says this in his institutes. Election is God's once establishment by his eternal and unchangeable plan. Those whom he long before determined once for all to receive into salvation. And those whom, on the other hand, he would devote to destruction. Right. How does the Apostle Paul answer the objection that election is not fair? In Romans 9, 10 through 24. So if you'll flip the page over to Romans 9. Um, how does Paul answer the objection that election is not fair? And I think that this question is helpful because... One of the ways the election gets opposed and attacked, this doctrine, is by saying, if what you're saying is true, Mr. Calvinist, then God is not being fair because he's electing and then there's those who are reprobate. Uh, So how does Paul answer that objection? Uh, Mr. Noel. I believe he answers that question by saying that man is not uh, like qualified or in the position to make that determination to begin with. In um, verse 19, he will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? I think that's how he answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Uh, Zavio. Okay, uh, Brianna. Um, he also um, points out. Paul also points out good and how he's like creature. Says you owe man. So you have God, the Creator, and you have this creature. So if you have a man, cannot act towards God because of his. I, I, because I saw Xavier and said him, and then I saw Pastor Rick next. Um, to me, um, I, mean, I agree with all of the answers. Um, but I was focusing more on verse um, 15, just the, one, the word mercy. Um, and the reason why is because, um, like, none of us deserve, you know, salvation. We, so God is not being fair because, like, he, he chooses whom, to whom he can have mercy on, you know, like we're all like guilty, you know, we, we're all deserving, we're all on our way to hell, you know, and running towards hell, you know, so if the Lord chooses to say some, it's, it's actually something good that he's doing, you know, he's saving, so, so I, I think of mercy when, when I hear that question, you know. Yeah. Pastor Bray. Yes, where the... Um uh, Noel, uh, uh, Brianna, they they really focused upon, I think rightly so, who is man, right? I think the text, uh, these the verses that you cited also point to the absolute freedom of God. God does what he wills, and we have nothing to say in return. Amen. So in verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So what is the reason? God loved. 
We have, we have, and, and Esau, he hates. We have nothing to say in response. Man cannot answer God and object and say, you have no right. No, God is free. He is free to choose to bestow his love upon whom he wills. Mm. Yeah. Uh, then again in verse 18, for then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Again, just God's freedom. Amen. Uh, someone told me one time, uh, if you don't preach election or teach it, you won't ever get these objections. The fact that Paul's addressing these objections shows that the doctrine of election is biblical. This is not a Calvinistic, grabbed out of the air idea. Um, the doctrines that get called Calvinism are biblical. And Paul's addressing objections throughout this letter. And here he's object, uh, addressing objections in regards to election. If it's not true, why is he addressing these objections? It's because it's true, my friend. Okay. Um, the next term is effectual calling, or I'm sorry, calling, but we I called it effectual calling. And I think we stop at 930. 940? Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. So in the back into Romans 8. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. <clears throat> when you look, when you look at the handout that you have, there's a definition on there. It's from John Murray. And I think in regards to what we're talking about, the, the doctrine of salvation today, and we're looking at some major aspects of that, um, the part that you want to look, uh, that deals with the application of salvation, I think John Murray's, we got this on our shelf, it's a really good book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. He says, the call that ushers men into, into a state of salvation and is therefore effectual. So this call is one that actually ushers them into a state of being saved. And because it does that, it's effectual. I want to read our confession Briefly. I'll just read uh, one paragraph. Those whom God hath predestined unto life, we just talked about predestination, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. And these are, this is what he does. This is what happens when a person is effectually called. Enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God. Taking away their heart of stone and giving to them a heart of flesh. Renewing their wills. And by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet so as they come most freely being made willing by his grace. No, what you want to say? I'm sorry, that was chapter 10 under effectual calling, paragraph 1. The reason why it's called effectual is because uh, it's irresistible. 
everybody who is a called in this way responds because of God's sovereignty. There is another call in scripture, the general call, or sometimes it's called the outward call, whereas this one's called the inward. If you look in Matthew 22, Verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. Tyler? I was just going to ask, um, what's necessarily the difference between effectual calling and regeneration? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the best teacher I've read on that is Murray in this book, actually. Um, let's first address this general call, and then I'll answer that. If you look in 14, he makes this, Jesus makes this statement, for many are called, but few are chosen. And in the parable of the wedding feast, um, there's many people who are invited, but they weren't willing to come. And then he sends them, he sends out his stewards or his messengers out to further extent to fill his, his feast, to fill his wedding. <clears throat> okay, but there was a man there without a wedding garment. And he, he's an illustration of someone who entered. He was invited, but he came the wrong way. He didn't have a garment. But this phrase, many are called, but, but few are chosen. The first phrase there, many are called, is not everybody that's called uh, makes it. In the parable, there were many who were not willing to come. They were called. They were invited to the wedding, but they did not come. <clears throat> so there's uh, a call here that is resisted. So there's a general call that everybody who hears the gospel is is getting a genuine call from God. It's actual and true, and it's a genuine call to salvation in Christ. But not all those who hear that gospel are effectually called, because not all come. But all those that do come, why do they come? Because they were effectually called. Because the effectual call, God does what they can't and won't do. He enlightens their minds spiritually. He takes away their heart of stone. He renews their wills. And his mighty power determining that which is good. He draws them to Jesus. And back in Romans 8, one of the things Paul is laboring to stress through this golden chain is the sovereignty of God and the fulfillment of his plan. It's out of context for Paul to be referencing the general call. A, a call that is not uh, always fulfilled and obeyed. Because all these things are things that God does alone. He's the one who foreknows. He's the one who predestines. And if I skip past call, he's the one who justifies and he's the one who glorifies. And now you're going to tell, you're going to try to, to argue that the call is the general call. It, it doesn't fit. So Tyler's question uh, about what's the difference between the effectual call and regeneration. 
I haven't read a lot on it, so if I'm wrong, I'll leave it up to one of the elders to correct this, but it's coming from John Murray, and I thought it was helpful. Uh, let me just turn there real quick. It, he, eighty-eight. He basically um, argues that effectual call precedes regeneration. Um, they are they go together and they're inseparable. But the call is coming from God where he describes it as God summoning you. And when he summons you, he regenerates you to make that summons effective. But the actual call coming from him is there's distinguishable difference between the regeneration. He calls it a difference of priority. Um, that's the gist of it, and his his uh, one of his arguments is in this golden chain. Paul's not saying regeneration or born again; he's saying called because in the application of redemption, uh, he's wanting to start at the very beginning, which is totally of God, where God initiates that call. That we, you know that brings in the regeneration and puts them into union with Christ in the application of redemption. So one of his arguments is because of Paul's desire to bring out the sovereignty of God, he uses called here because that's initial and has a priority of regeneration. So his argument isn't like airtight, but I thought it had some logic to it and it made sense to me. So I haven't read a lot on that. <clears throat> From Murray. Oh, that great. I think it's helpful. It's, um, I can't remember what page, but it's, uh, it's from the same book. And what Murray ar argues is correct is the external. So, uh, and you, uh, you said this, but to summarize is the effectual call there is a sense where it is external, right? Mm -hmm. the, it's it's the proclamation of the gospel. It's that mm -hmm. call, that summons. So it's external, right? But that same call has an internal effect, which is regeneration. So uh, Murray puts it this way. He says, God's call, since it is effectual, carries with it the operative grace whereby the person called is enabled to answer the call and to embrace Jesus Christ as he is freely offered in the gospel. Amen. Does anybody else have any questions on uh, Isaiah? So what would be the difference between justification and regeneration? Justification and regeneration? Uh, regeneration, there's... Uh, I don't know how to best word this, but there's a change in the heart of the person. They're being made alive. They're being enlightened, and their heart is being changed. In justification, their their heart's not being changed because of the justification. The justification is a legal act of God where he declares someone righteous based on the imputed righteousness of Christ. But that legal declaration, justified, is not the changing of the man. But they they go together because justification comes through the instrument of faith. So how do we receive the imputed righteousness of Christ? By faith. It's an instrument. But the, the basis or the ground for our justification is not our faith. It's the righteousness of Christ which has been imputed to us. But in receiving that imputed righteousness by faith, um, how do I get faith? It comes by regeneration. So regeneration actually is involved in justification. 
Rebecca. I have a verse that kind of helps with the um, effectual call and the outward call and how the effectual is different because it's mixed with grace um, and faith. So in Hebrews 4, um, verse 2, For indeed we have had the... We have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Yeah, amen. That's a good text, too. Clearly, they wasn't united with faith, and they heard. Okay. Uh, well, I think I'm going to move on to justification since he asked the question and time sake. Does anybody have any other questions about the effectual call? Okay. Azavio. Um, if anything, you know, you can talk to me maybe after, but I was... I had a question um, about um, in the confession, uh, chapter 10, paragraph 3, um, t- talks about the elect infant dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit, who works where, uh, when and where and how he pleases. So also are all other elect persons who are incap- incapable, how you say that? In- incapable of being um, hourly called by the ministry, the word. Um, is there any, you know, as, as I'm thinking about the topic of, you know, calling and, and all that, um, I was reading that paragraph and I was a little confused by it, you know, I was going to, but if, if it's going to, I don't want to, yeah, you know, if you have fun in there. Uh, I would like to handle that one outside of this time, but that's a good, good question. <clears throat> well, let's go to justification. It's the next term in this golden chain. The last one is glorification. Justification is an instantaneous legal act of God in which he thinks of our sins as forgiven and Christ's righteousness as belonging to us and declares us to be righteous in his sight. Wayne Grudem. Uh, Murray brings out the value of justification. If justification is confused... With regeneration, like we were talking about that, if you confuse those two uh, willfully, even ignorantly, it has its effects. But I mean, if you press on, first thing, the door is opened. If you confuse justification with, with regeneration or sanctification, the door is open for the perversion of the gospel at its center. Justification is still the article of the standing or following of the church. It's, he's trying to bring out the value of justification. Like It's very important we have a sound theology on justification. The truth of justification, this is continuing Murray, has suffered at the hands of human perversion as much as any doctrine. One of the ways in which it has been perverted is the failure to reckon with the meaning of the term. What, is just, what does the term mean? Justification does not mean to make righteous. So when you say, I justify you, like a judge says, he's not making that person righteous. It doesn't mean making them good or holy or upright. A believer is made holy. So he's giving a concession here. Yes, a believer is made holy in the application of redemption, but justification is, does not refer to this renewing and sanctifying grace of God. Justification is simply a declaration or pronouncement respecting the relation of the person to the law which the judge is required to administer. So you look at Deuteronomy 25. Verse 1. If there is a dispute between men and they come to court that the judges may judge them and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be if the wicked man 
deserves to be beaten, that the judge will cause him to lie down and be beaten in, the, in his presence according to his guilt with a certain number of blows. It was not the duty of judges to make people righteous. That's not what is happening here. When you justify the righteous, it's you discern based off of why you're in front of me. Have you obeyed the law? You have. Okay. I declare you righteous according to that law. What I just did as if I were a judge is I justified him. I didn't make him righteous. He was already righteous when he came up. All I did was declare through the civil authority that I have the judgment of justified. And if someone's done wickedness and the law shows their guilt, then I will declare them condemned. But I'm not making them wicked. I'm declaring and bringing a legal judgment upon what is before me. Does that help? Uh, let's look at it. Proverbs seventeen fifteen. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them are like are an abomination to the Lord. Uh, Proverbs seventeen fifteen. So you justify the wicked. That means you have a wicked person in front of you before the court, and you say you're justified, you're righteous. You make a judgment, a legal declaration. He's righteous, but he's wicked. He's guilty, but you legally declare him righteous. God says that's an abomination to him. And vice versa, if someone's legally right or they're righteous and then you condemn them and you say, I declare you condemned and guilty, that's an abomination to the Lord. It was not the duty of judges. I'm sorry. Justification is contrasted with condemnation. So you can see there, not only are you getting a better understanding of justification, but learn what justification means by learning what condemnation means. The contrast with one another here. Condemn never means to make wicked. And so justify cannot mean to make good or upright. Justification means to declare to be righteous. Now, if it is, an abo- if it is abominable to justify the righteous, I'm sorry, uh, the wicked. If it's abominable to God to justify the wicked, what is it that enables God to be just when he justifies sinners? Does God justify sinners? What enables him to do that, knowing it's wicked for him to do that? Amen. We'll leave it at that because I uh, need to close. But it's, it's, I think it's a very good point to end on, is God justifies us. Not because we're righteous, but because of a righteousness outside of us that has been given to us. So he's just when he justifies us, but it's not because of our righteousness. And one of the designs of that is that he gets all the glory. So let's pray. Gracious God in heaven and Oh, Son and Holy Spirit, we praise your holy name and thank you for the golden chain of salvation, of redemption. I thank you for the comfort that it gives me to know uh, when I can see that I've been called and I love God, that uh, I've been foreknown and that I will be glorified and so will my brothers and sisters. We praise you for this assurance that comes by faith in this truth. Help us to persevere by it through the sufferings that aren't worthy to be compared to the glory to come. Amen.